Jesus is the better prophet. Listen, the superior prophet, the final prophet, the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is not only the final, but he is the word of God in the beginning. He's the final word, but he's always been the word John 1, 1 tells us as he paints Jesus into the creation story and says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. But not only that, the word was God. And there is nothing in this earth that's been made that wasn't made through him. Brothers, he is the origin of all things, including prophecy. He is the answer to all things. He is the beginning and the end, the first, the last, the alpha and the omega. What is prophecy? If you don't know, because people tell you it means something all the time, you know, it's like about predicting the future. Prophecy means to speak on behalf of God. That's what prophecy is. And Jesus is prophecy. Why? Because Jesus himself is the word of God. The title of this sermon is The Power of an Indestructible Life. The power of an indestructible life. Chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to Abraham apportioned a tenth of a part of everything to him. He is first, by translation, his name, king of righteousness. And then also it is king of Salem. That is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy. We're talking about Melchizedek here. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a command in the law to take a tithe from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from receiving, excuse me, but this man who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. In the other case, by the one whom is testified he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. <clears throat> now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to be raised up after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, for which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with the tribe of Moses, he said nothing about priests." This becomes more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirements concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, the former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath for those who formerly became priests were made so without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priest were mainly or many in number because they were prevented they were prevented by death to from continuing in office but he holds his priestly his priesthood permanently because he continues forever consequently he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them 
For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifice daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men and their weakness as high priest. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Lord, I, I just pray as we, we gaze into some mysterious stuff, Lord, about a mysterious figure that shows up in the Old Testament, Melchizedek. Lord, that we would see what you're trying to show us, Lord, that, that, that Jesus is a priest who will be our priest forever, Lord, a king who will reign forever, a prophet whose word will come to pass, Lord. We thank you for our lives, Lord, as we live in Christ Lord, my heart breaks and aches for people that get close to the perimeter, Lord, but never cross over into the place where they put their faith and trust in you and live in you and you alone, Lord. Lord, I pray that maybe a few today would, would begin to make that journey, Lord, that you would draw them by the Spirit in the only way, in, in a way that only you can, Lord. Lord, use this word to conform us to the image of Christ. Lord, let us see that there is a better covenant an enduring covenant, even beyond the, the Levitical priesthood, but, but beyond any guarantee or promise that we have in this world. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Let me get a drink real quick. <clears throat> so, chapter 7 says a lot. We could go through it line by line and talk about it. We're going to take it as a chapter and just talk about the big pieces of it and the main point it's communicating. Let's remember the last chapter closed by saying or talking about the certainty of God's <laughs> promise. We remember that last time we were in Hebrews, we talked about the fact that we can bank on the promise, not because of the way it was made or, or because of of things we see or, or things we understand, but because of the person who made the promise. Listen, that, that holds true in this life. Certain people's word holds truer than others. People who have kept their word more often to you. People who, who you know can back up their word, right? There's many people in this life who make promises and say stuff that really doesn't mean that much. But I would say even those of us who try to keep our word and to be men of integrity, all of us fall short in holding up to our word. Sometimes because we didn't really mean it, but sometimes because circumstances just didn't allow for it. We had the best of intentions. We thought it through, but it didn't hold together. See, God doesn't have that problem because when God sets his word into motion, it will come to pass. We can trust in the promise because the guarantor of the promise will not fail, has never failed. And this is what we hold fast to, or as the, the author of Hebrews said in chapter 6, this is what our faith and our hope is anchored to. If this is what you are anchored to, you will not be blown away by the winds and the waves of life. You will not drift off uh, to some far place out to sea because you will be anchored to something that will never let go of you. This is the certainty we have. This, was, this is what anchors our life as Christians. Verse 19 of chapter 6 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And we've talked a little bit about this, but I'm just going to mention this. There are no priests in the Old Testament mentioned other than this person that didn't ascend from the line of Levi. Levi was the priestly lineage that God set into place during the time of Moses and Aaron and the Exodus as the law of God was given to the Jews. And this certain tribe of people would be the priest, the anointed priest on God's behalf. 
And these people would make sacrifice every year for the sin of these people. The author of Hebrews points out a, a weakness in these priests, though. They, too, being sinful men, also had to make sacrifice on their own behalf. And it had to be done continuously because not only was, was what they were sacrificing not pure and true enough, but they themselves were priests who would not be able to make intercession forever. They would die off. They were human men. How did you become a priest in the time of the Old Testament? You were born out of the tribe of Levi. The end. So what, what does it mean when this guy shows up in the book of Genesis long before Moses? To the father of the Jewish people, Abraham, this mysterious figure shows up. And not only does he give a sort of archetype of communion, in Genesis 14 it says that he brought bread and wine and they partook and that Abraham tithed, he gave a 10% offering to to Abraham, who is this guy? You know, what does it say here in chapter seven? It's obvious that we, we give to those who are greater than us and we are blessed by those who are greater than us. It doesn't happen the other way around. The superior blesses the inferior. And I'm not saying you're inferior as people, but if, but if you don't have the money to pay your bills and someone blesses you, someone with a superior amount of money made it possible for you to pay your bills. If you couldn't lift something because you, you were weak and someone who was stronger came and lifted it off of your leg, you know, some, I don't know, car or something fell on your leg, you couldn't get off and some he-man comes over, you were blessed by the fact that his strength was stronger than yours. It is true, you have to have something that someone doesn't have. And in this case, this guy shows up, the greatest person at this time in the Old Testament, Abraham, and Abraham tithed to him. He gave communion or took communion with him. It says he, he was blessed by him. Who is Melchizedek? There's only two options. And I'm here to tell you that I know many, many preachers who, who shy away from talking about this. And uh, to be honest with you, sometimes it would be easier to <laughs> because it is a mysterious figure. Melchizedek. We first hear about this figure in Genesis chapter 14. And let me say this man is very mysterious. There's only two schools of thought on this, and I'm going to tell you what both of them are. But either way, the principle that we learn from Melchizedek is true nonetheless. Has anybody ever heard the term Christophany? A Christophany is a theological term where the pre-incarnate, you know, incarnate meant the incarnation is when Christ was born into the world. Didn't mean he came into existence because Christ always has been because he's God. But there was a point in history where Christ entered history and that was called the incarnation. A Christophany is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. A lot of people would say that the fourth person in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could possibly have been a Christophany, Jesus, the fourth man in the fiery furnace. There's people that would, that would say that it was the God himself that wrestled with Jacob. God the Father? No, God the Father is immaterial. The Son taking on some sort of form, entering creation before he was made flesh. And either Melchizedek was a king and priest which is unprecedented to be both, by the way, a king and priest that comes from a kingdom that is so ancient that nobody has any historical evidence of it. And this person is a foreshadowing, just like all the rest of the other figures and the, the better sacrifice, the better, you know, all these other things mentioned in Hebrew. He's either that or this is an appearing of Christ in the Old Testament. Now, if there's people that I admire, scholarly people, we won't spend a lot of time talking about the theological implications of this, but there's a lot of people, I believe, that are very intelligent scholars that, that believe both. I think it would be foolish to do two things. One thing would be to jump headfirst and say, for sure, this is what this is. There's not enough evidence to, to, to say that. But it would also be foolish 
to write this off as something that, that, that isn't mysterious. And I'll explain why. I personally, not that this matters, I personally believe this is an appearing of Christ. And here's why I believe that. Let me make this case for you very quickly. Every other comparison in the book of Hebrews, Jesus compared to Moses as the better savior. Even though Moses was a savior of types, there's something that it shows where Moses was inferior. When Jesus is compared to the sacrifice, there's a showing of Christ being perfect and the sacrifice he's being compared to being inferior. And on and on and on. Every single time, you know, that's what we're learning here, right? That Jesus is the better king, the better sacrifice, the better priest, the better word. That's what Jesus is. And Hebrews is a comparison of these temporal things that are passing away and the permanent priest, king, and prophet who will never pass away, Jesus. But in the case of Melchizedek, that case is not made. In fact, the only thing shown as inferior is the Levitical priesthood. Not this man who appears before Abraham. Just listen to the language of the text. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. Wait a minute, I thought only priests came from Levi. Well, there is no Levi yet. Listen, after returning from his slaughter of the kings, he blessed him. And to Abraham, Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. So talking about Melchizedek, it says, He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means, king of righteousness. There's not, this title is not attributed to anything else in the Bible but Jesus. There is no other king of righteousness. The book of Revelation says there is no other king of righteousness. I'm not going to preach on this too hard, but I just want to show you why I believe this. First, by translation, his name, King of Righteousness, but then also King of Salem. That is King of Peace. The word Salem means peace. Jerusalem means city of peace. So he's the King of Salem, the King of Peace. He's the King of Righteousness. Okay, that, we, could, we could get around that. Then we have some other problems with just thinking this is a mere man. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days or end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He continues a priest forever. We're talking about Melchizedek, not Jesus. What does it say earlier in Hebrews? There's only one priest who endures forever. So either this man is a man who we know nothing about and the beginning of genealogy, no genealogy, no beginning or ending of days means that we don't know those things. That could mean that. It could mean we don't know where he came from and where he went. But the language doesn't seem to say that. The language seems to say that this man showed up Abraham realized that he was much greater than him. He tied to him. This man doesn't have a father or a mother or genealogy, and he remains a priest forever. In my opinion, this was Christ starting or revealing, not even starting, scratch that, revealing a priesthood that predates the Levitical priesthood and would outlast the Levitical priesthood. Just like all things in this world that are foreshadowings. So we've talked a little bit about who Melchizedek is. I'm not going to belabor this point too much because it it, it is easy to drift into the sensational. But either way, either way, this is the kind of priesthood that Jesus himself represents. Some believe Melchizedek was a Christophany, while others do not. But either way, what sets Christ apart 
as a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, a priesthood that has no origin, a priesthood that has no ending, a priesthood that, that is superior to any king or priesthood in any sense, way, form, fashion in the history of the world ever will be, ever was. All the things that make him superior, uh, excuse me, superior are laid out through this book. But there is one thing that overshadows all the rest. He fulfilled prophecy. He is the word of God. He's a better king. He's a sacrifice that, that could actually atone for our sins once and for all. But what makes him qualified for this? More than anything else. Well, this, this chapter tells us, and this is what we're going to talk a lot about. He is a priest forever, a superior and better priest, like in the case of Melchizedek. And here's why I believe also that Melchizedek is a pre-incarnate Jesus, because it says he has the right to say and do this on the virtue of his indestructible life. And we're going to come back to that. Here's a few points. It's going to be a, a, a little different way I preach today. Number one, Melchizedek was a priest and king. This dual office is unheard of in the Bible. There is no other place where there is a prophet, excuse me, a priest who is also a king. Because the, the priest and the king hold each other accountable, like the prophet holds, each, holds the king accountable. How can you have a king who is also the priest? All other priests were priests because they were born into the Levitical priesthood. These priests were sinners and also needed sacrifice for their sins. But like Melchizedek, Jesus was born as a priest. Like Melchizedek, Jesus has no beginning. His kingdom will never end. And he is and was a priest on account of the fact that he himself has an indestructible life. Hear this, brothers, death didn't hold him. We talk about that like, man, he, like he, there was this big fight and he overcame death and he overcame the devil. There was no fight. Death didn't overcome him. Death couldn't overcome him. Jesus' life cannot be extinguished. If he ceased to be God, the world would cease to be. We cannot overstate the value and importance of this. The fact that Jesus took on flesh at some point in history is a thing he did on behalf of you and me. But the fact that he is a priest and king and God forever is something that he has always had. He has always been the king. He has always been a high priest. He has always been the prophet. We'll talk more about that in a second. But he is a priest that this, this chapter of scripture says continually and always makes intercession for us. His whole life, his whole existence, his whole connection with this earth is to make intercession for us. You know, God was making intercession for you before you were even formed. Just like Abraham paid a tithe for an ancestor who hadn't been born, let, that, let your head get around that for a minute. Verse 22. This makes Jesus the guarantee of a better covenant. He's the guarantor. Do you guys know what a guarantor is? A guarantor means that the promise of payment is something you can bank on because of what? The ability to pay. What is, when you, you know, if you don't have good credit, what do you got to do when you, when you want some money? You got to put up some collateral. Or you got to have a history of showing you repay. Your credit score is real high. This guy always pays his bills. Paid three cars off. Owns a home. We can take a chance on him. See, Jesus isn't a chance. He holds the world in his hands. Why is this important to you today? Because all of you are sitting here in various stages of either sanctification as Christians or outside of Christ, wondering what this is all about. There's many people that try to argue for God on the basis of his goodness. 
And that's a, that's the ba- that's a bad way to come into to arguing for God. Because I'm arguing with a depraved mind and a corrupt heart. And I'm trying to explain to you what goodness is. And you don't know what goodness is. Well, if God was good, you know, why didn't he save everybody? The real question is, if God's God, why does he save anybody? See, the most important question we need to ask is not God good. If you're wrestling with all this stuff and you're wondering to yourself, is this Christian stuff real? The question you should be asking isn't God good. The question you should be asking is, is God God? Is the God of this book real? It don't matter if you accept him or not. If God is God, the God of this Bible is true, then you're subject to everything his word says. And most people, not everybody, there are real skeptics and there are real atheists, but most people who who turn their their heart and their mind away and say, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions and God never did nothing for me. I, I know there's so many contradictions in the Bible. I'd say 99 out of 100 of those people don't even know what they're talking about. I always ask, tell me which one you're talking about. I'd love to discuss it with you. Not because I want to win an argument. I want to, there are some weird stuff in this book. Let's talk about it. But most of the time, it's not because they put any real thought into who God is. See, we care a lot more about who we are and how God fits into our life than whether or not there is a sovereign Lord of the universe that we're subject to. I talk about this all the time, but we got to get God right and who God is before we can figure anything else out. We need to look at, at the sovereign Lord of the universe. We don't worry about how we fit into it or if God's good or if he's going to bless us or if he'll change our life. The first thing we need to do is to fear, know and fear the Lord. Because when we have God in proper perspective and we have ourselves in proper perspective, Grace looks like a beautiful gift that it really is. You guys are going to hear this a lot from me. You'll be able to preach this part of my sermon by the time you leave here, I hope, because it will be your duty in life to do so. Jesus is the guarantor of this better covenant. And he proves that he is, that he has overcome death, hell, and the grave on the basis of his indestructible life. And it doesn't say that he's able to begrudgingly or barely save us. It says he saves us to the uttermost. Ooh, I like the way that sounds. The uttermost. There ain't no stain of sin left on you. There ain't no record of wrong if you are in Christ. The blood of lamb washes us white as snow. The reason why we have a hard time accepting that is because the love of God is a love that we can't perceive. The forgiveness of of God is something that we can't even comprehend. The way God deals with us, wretched sinners, it's too much for us to even think about. We have a hard time forgiving a dude that talks crazy to us, much less uh, a, a lifetime of sins and blasphemy towards a God who graciously gave his life for us. It's hard to comprehend. But the idea that not only Christ's life was indestructible, but that he was willing to take on flesh for us shows not only that he is a better covenant and the guarantor of our salvation, but also his intentions were good towards us. Jesus came on the scene as a man only for one reason. There was no other reason for him to walk out life on this earth, to be a baby, to be crucified, to live a perfect life, to rise in bodily resurrection again, except for us. That should get you excited. And when you doubt your salvation and when you doubt if God cares about you or if his salvation is strong enough for you, just gaze at the cross for a minute. Think about the way they beat him and tore him apart and how he walked out of that tomb walked out of that tomb in power. Consequently, he is able to save us to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is a king that God the Father himself sent on our behalf. All other kingdoms pale in comparison. Man, I... I, I should be more than halfway through. Moving on. 
Here's a good, here's some other good news as well. We weren't merely here, just like Jesus wasn't born into a priesthood, that he is a priest forever based on the fact that he has an indestructible life. Us too were, were uh, by no accident called to be children of God. We weren't born into it. God don't got grandchildren. You were not born a child of God. You were made in his image. You were snatched from the fire. God chose you to be part of his kingdom. That should make us feel good. We were handpicked to be sons and daughters in the only kingdom that will never pass away. Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, psalm in the Old Testament. It is the most quoted psalm. It's a pretty short psalm. It's interesting that King David, the most revered king in Israel's history, in this prophetical writing, writes of longing for a greater king. I mean, there's not... Of course, Solomon had all the, the benefits of David's kingdoms, but there's no, they don't, people don't revere Solomon as the king like they did David. It's from the line of David. That's something to be proud of. David is the most revered king in, in Israel's history, and this great king is, is wandering in this prophetic psalm, looking towards a better king. Psalm 110 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Lord says to my Lord. Okay. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. It's talking about Jesus. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. He's the king forever in the order of Melchizedek. King David at the pinnacle of his power writes of the need for a better and eternal priest and king that is yet to come. One that would execute justice and judgment among the nations. That would shatter wicked kings and all other kings. This kingdom and king would be validated by what? An oath from God himself. God himself said, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Number two, Jesus is the Christ. How many of you know that Christ is not Jesus' last name? Christ is a designation. It is a title. Christ is the Greek equivalent of the word Messiah or in Hebrew, Mashiach. It simply means the, capital T-H-E, the anointed one. See, in the Old Testament, there were three groups of people who were anointed by God to serve certain offices, as imperfect as they were. You had the prophet, the prophet who was anointed by God to speak on God's behalf. Thus saith the Lord, God warns you, Israel, turn from your sins and your idolatry. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Hezekiah, not Hezekiah, um, Malachi, the minor prophets, the major prophets. These people spoke on behalf of God, anointed to do so. What does the beginning of Hebrews say in chapter 1? In previous times, God spoke in a variety of ways to his people through the prophets. But in this time, God has chose to reveal himself through his son, the word we don't need, we, listen, we don't have to look for a messenger anymore because we have access to the word himself. Listen, if you were, and I'm sorry if it's ever hard to get a hold of me here. I know it's been recently, but if you were trying to get a hold of me in my office and you sent James Armbruster up and James came to my office, he said, listen, the guys want to know about this or that. And James comes down and delivers a message for me. But he didn't quite, well, you asked some questions about it. What about this or that? He's like, I'm not really sure this is what he said. I, I'm trying to just deliver the message the best I can. 
And James is sitting there trying to explain me to you. And then I walked downstairs and I said, hey, did any of you guys have any questions about what I just said, sent James down to? Would you continue talking to James about the message I, I'm, I'm giving? No, of course not. You would have the source there. You'd find out exactly what you needed. Why then would we look to something inferior when we have the word? Everything we need for life and godliness is in this word. Jesus fulfilled all prophecy because Jesus is prophecy. Jesus is the word. He's also a better king. Listen. In the Old Testament, the chosen ones, the prophets, the priests, and the kings. Listen, David was a ruler who dispensed justice. He was a good king, right? But even righteous kings fell short. Even Israel's most honored king had blood on his hands from sin. We like to look at David. I, mean, I, I look at David's life and I think, man, there's hope for all of us. If you don't know, David had a guy killed because he knocked up his wife while that guy was out serving him in war. Killed him. Had an illegitimate child after having an adulterous affair. And we revere this man as the, as the great king of Israel. With blood on his hands, though, David knew that there, needed, that there was a justice beyond his justice. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. But Jesus is also a better king. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, it says, He is clothed in a robe that is dipped in blood, and by the name which is called the Word of God, and the armies of heaven, they are arraigned in fine linen, white and pure, we're following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of fury and of wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We say that so much in songs, I don't think you understand that. Think about every great person that's ever lived in this world and, and morph them into a super king or a super president or a super dictator. And that man one day will bow before Jesus and tremble with fear because he is the king of all kings and he is the Lord of all lords. David had blood on his robe from injustice, but Jesus has a robe dipped in blood that satisfied the wrath and justice of God himself. Verse 26. Jesus is a better priest, for it is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, talking about Jesus, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those of other high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for of his own sins, but those of for the people, since he did once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priest, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son that has been made perfect forever. When it says been made perfect, it doesn't mean Jesus was imperfect and became perfect. To be truly perfect, you must have always been perfect. Made perfect in our sight. Made perfect as a man who walked among us. But always having been perfect. If something's working towards perfection, it will never be perfect. Perfect means without flaw, without error. Looking back to Melchizedek, they're painting a picture of this person who appeared on the scene and who was greater than the greatest man in the Old Testament. This, this man tied to him. This man broke bread and wine with him like Jesus would with his disciples one day. And this is painting a picture for us that we have a priest that is greater, that predates the priesthood, that is a priest of perfection. I know this is lofty and hard, but, but grab onto this. This is something deep to sink your teeth into. What is prophecy? Jesus is the better prophet. Listen. The superior prophet, the final prophet, the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is not only the final, but he is the word of God in the beginning. He's the final word, but he's always been the word John 1.1 tells us. As he 
paints Jesus into the creation story and says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. But not only that, the word was God. And there is nothing in this earth that's been made that wasn't made through him. Brothers, he is the origin of all things, including prophecy. He is the answer to all things. He is the beginning and the end, the first, the last, the alpha and the omega. What is prophecy? If you don't know, because people tell you it means something all the time. You know, it's like about predicting the future. Prophecy means to speak on behalf of God. That's what prophecy is. And Jesus is prophecy. Why? Because Jesus himself is the word of God. In closing, Jesus didn't miraculously raise from the dead. Hear me. It seems miraculous to us because death is the one thing that is set before all of us. Some of us ignored it for a long time while we are numbing the pain with a needle or a pipe or through sexual encounters or through the, the pursuit of money and success in this world. But as you get older, as your body gives out, as life happens, one thing will become clear to you. No matter if you've shot your face up with Botox and your bank's full of millions of dollars, there will come a moment where your life will begin to unravel. Your physical health will begin to unravel. Some of us are going to live longer than others. But we all face the darkness of death. And Jesus' resurrection wasn't miraculous because death could not hold him. Darkness could not quench him. He is life and he is light. And when you are sitting in the darkness of your life, this is the light that should illuminate you. Listen, if you've seen the beauty of Christ, the light that changed your life, blind eyes that can see and deaf ears that can hear, your life is going to look different. You're going to live different, not because of legalism, but because you've seen something. We go back again and again and again because we don't see Jesus. Jesus didn't miraculously raise from the dead. It seems miraculous to us because death is the unavoidable faith, fate that all humans face. And all humans, even the ones who act like they don't fear. We have no solution for it in and of ourselves. Jesus raised from the dead. Why? On the account of the fact that his life is indestructible because he is life. There has never been a chance, nor was there ever a chance that death would actually hold him in his place. His life is indestructible because he is life. Darkness can't suppress him because he is light. And the question the author of Hebrews asks you is not to, to put God, not to judge God, not to look and see, try to nitpick if he's good enough for you. The question is, are you anchored to him? That's all that matters. When you look at the darkness of life, hear me. There was a time where I looked at the darkness of life too and my own suffering and my own plight and bad things in the world. And I used to think, how could this be True, if God is real, but now I realize that all the darkness of this life is set as a backdrop to magnify the glory and brightness of God. Guess what? All the bad things magnify His glory. All the good things pale in comparison to the radiant light that is Christ. Everything that is good is marginalized by his supremacy in all things. His beauty outshines the sun and his life is indestructible so that all who are hidden in him are also indestructible. Here's the closing remark. The question isn't, is Jesus the prophet, the priest, the king, the question is, is he your prophet, priest and king? Will the prophetic word of the Lord draw you to repentance or will it be your condemnation? Will the priestly sacrificial blood of the lamb be salvation for you, salvation for your sins, or will the blood of the lamb be on your hands? 
Will you surrender unconditionally to the king and be his servant in this life? Or, like everyone else, will you be crushed and made a footstool for him to set his feet on in the next? Because he is the king. There's only going to be two groups of people. People who bow before him in this life, graciously and humbly, or people that are crushed by the rock of ages as God makes them a footstool for his son to the glory of Jesus forever. Philippians 2.9 says, Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, some will bow in honor. I bow before Jesus in honor in this life, but some will bow in shame in the life to come. The, the justice that comes from the blood of the Lamb will save those who fall under its salvation, but it will be an indictment against those who reject the king who died for you. You need a word from God? Jesus is your prophet. You need remission or forgiveness from your sins? Jesus is your better priest. And listen, like it or not, Jesus is the king above all kings. And he will rule forever. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Lord, I thank you for the fact that your word is true and sure. Lord, if we will just look into it, God, with the same sort of affection we look towards anything we love, Lord, anything we were curious about, Lord, that you will reveal yourself to us through your word. Lord, an unshakable guarantee, Lord, that you will never leave us or forsake us if in fact we are in you, Lord. Lord, I pray that every man under the sound of my voice, God, would, would be drawn to conviction, Lord, that they would, they would take another step towards surrendering their life to you ultimately and forever, Lord. Lord, I pray for every man who has surrendered his life to you, Lord, Lord, that you would remind him that he's not alone in this, Lord, not just because he's got brothers all around him, but because you are with him. Lord, your spirit is living inside of him. And Lord, that you will never leave him or forsake him. And though the darkness comes and the night seem long, joy comes in the morning. In Jesus' name, amen.